All right, uh, welcome back everybody to Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, um, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, as usual. And uh, tonight we're going to be continuing our study of the Bodhisattva path. And tonight, the, the theme, the word for this evening, we're going to be talking about uh, Raja or Rajas dust, <laughs> the dust. <laughs> so at first, this might sound like, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about cleaning. We're going to talk about uh, what's, what's the dust. So there's this word. So the word tonight that we're going to be looking at is this word Raja, R-A-J-A, -A, but it is usually maybe Rajas, but we're going to kind of work with both of those. And it's a word that means dust. And I've been doing a lot of digging into this word. So first of all, once we get into this, you're going to remember, you're going to be like, oh yeah, the Buddhists are always talking about this dust. And they are often talking about dust in a lot of different ways. So I went digging into this word that they keep using, that they keep referring to, and just to kind of kind of plant a seed in your mind in a way for this evening, it seems that the origin of this word, Raja, it, it means dust, but the specific kind of dust is pollen. So very fine dust in that way. However, there also seems to be something kind of reproductive and sexual about this particular dust, which also is a lot like pollen that way. Because of course, pollen, Pollen is a very special kind of dust in that way. So, uh, by the way, again, that the, the idea of pollen, that's just the etymology of this Sanskrit word. It seems to go back to pollen, but then by extension to dust in general. Then the Buddhists pick up on this idea of the dust and it starts to become a major part of the tradition. And so I put together for this evening a kind of quick little, um, I don't know what you would call it, um, kind of a genealogy, I suppose, a genealogy of the use of the word dust in Buddhism. And just to start us off, I always like to go back when dealing with things Buddhist in that way, we always like to go back to the Pali language, right? That kind of old school, very arcane, uh, original kind of language of Buddhism. And that means we're going to go back to the Diga Nikaya, the long discourses of the Buddha from the Pali canon. And we're going to go to one of the older, more original suttas in the Diga Nikaya, so we're going to go to the sutta number two, the Samana Pala Sutta, the, the fruits of the homeless life. And, you know, I've taught this sutra a lot. It's one of my favorite of the older sutras. I think it's so important. It just covers sort of the, the entirety of the early path or the early practice. And if you're not familiar with this sutta, it's a really interesting one because it's about this king, a very famous king named Ajatashatru, who, mm, well, he happened to have seemingly murdered his father in order to become the king. And so was having a lot of guilt about that. That's what this sutra is actually about. And so the king, King Ajatashatru, wanting to alleviate his suffering and wanting to alleviate the guilt that he was carrying and wanting to do something about this karma, the karma of having done this. The king goes and 
consults with a variety of different wise people of the forest. And one by one, they each keep tell the king, oh, you want to get rid of your guilt? You want to do this? And they tell him all kinds of different things, all kinds of different fasting practices or austerities in that way, or actually even all kinds of philosophies about how there's no such thing as karmic retribution and you don't have to worry about it. And none of those answers really satisfy the king until he goes to see the Buddha. And that's what the sutra is about. And the king, he wants to know from the Buddha, what are the, what are the benefits of what you're doing here? What are the fruits? of the homeless life? What are the fruits of of this way of life that you're encouraging? What are the advantages of it? And I love this this sutra because it's kind of funny because the Buddha says to the king, right? King of Jatashatru. He says, oh, well, imagine there was one of your servants, one of your slaves that wanted to renounce and go off to the woods to become a holy person if that person came back would you make them serve you would you would you make them your slave again and the king says well no if if they did that they'd be a holy person worthy of my reverence and worthy of offerings and the buddha says hey right there that sounds like a benefit (laughs) to this homeless life. That sounds like a fruit. Now, of course, the king is thinking, yeah, that's that's good for one of my servants, <laughs> but that's not so good for me, the king. So he says to the Buddha, yeah, you, you, is there another benefit, another fruit of the homeless life? Maybe that's a little better than that. And the Buddha gives him another example of somebody who just is a kind of a merchant in that way also leaves the, the, the household life. And the king's not satisfied with that because he too isn't a merchant. So then he says, come on, Buddha, you have anything, another fruit, another benefit of what you're doing here? And that's actually when the Buddha says, yeah, I do. And he actually does this thing where he kind of shifts gears and he says, yeah, I do. Now pay really close attention, king. And the king's like, okay. And the Buddha basically says, so imagine that a Buddha appears in the world and teaches the good Dharma. And now I'm going to quote from the sutra. And then this Dharma is heard by a householder or the child of a householder or one reborn into some family or another. Having heard this Dharma, they gain faith in the Buddha, the Tathagata. Having gained this faith, they reflect thus. The household life is close and dusty. The homeless life is as free as the air. It's not easy while living the household life to live the fully perfected holy life, purified and polished like a conch shell. And then it goes on there. But that's the line that I wanted to focus on. The line that the household life is close and dusty. So that seems to be one of the earlier original uses of this phrase, the dust, that the household life was dusty. And one of the things to keep in mind as as we go on this evening, the Buddhists love to play with words. They love these kind of poetic language games where they're kind kind of, I guess we would call it double entendres, where there's multiple uses of a, or meanings of a word going on at once. So when they talk about the household life being dusty, they kind of mean it literally, like you got to clean up and dust, dust the things off. And it's sort of a lot of work 
a lot of labor in that way. It's dusty. But then we start to kind of understand that the Buddhists use this word, the dust, in, a, in an other way. And this other way, it has to do with, well, it has to do with what we would call dharmas, by which I mean objects and things, stuff, okay? And the way that the early Buddhists use this idea of the dust is they describe our sensory organs, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the brain. Well, though those you should just know, in the Buddhist tradition are called ayatana. And the word ayatana means a, 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 a base. And it's important to kind of know that the Buddhists think of and describe the sensory organs as a, as a base because it's dharmas in a sense, it is phenomena, sensory objects that come and land on the ayatanas. For example, it's a little tricky with the eyes, it's a little tricky with the ears, but actually the nose is a really easy one. I don't know if you, you know, you know, but you have these uh, palettes inside your nose, these really, 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 really sensitive pieces of skin. And when little bits of pollen, <laughs> when little bits of things whoop, fly in, they land on those little pallets and you now can smell. You smell things because they've landed on the sensor. You can, the sensor of your nose. And you can kind of think of an ayatana as a sensor, like a sense base. They even sometimes translate ayatana as sense base. So now we have this metaphor, or it's even just a way of thinking of the sensory organs, but this idea that there's these eyes like sitting there <laughs> and these ears sitting there and these sounds come and land on them. These visions, these uh, visible forms come and land on our eyes. So they talk about sens sensual objects as being like this dust that comes and settles on our sensory objects or sensory organs, sorry. But then here's what happens. Our sensory organs can get dusty. And what that means is, is that there starts to be a kind of buildup of those sensory objects on the sensors. Now, a way to think about this, and so this is where we're gonna have to like, you know, kind of be juggling a lot of different meanings at once of the dust settling on these sensors. But there's another word I want to tell you about, and this is where the language game gets a little wild tonight. So this is the word we're working with, raja, raja, or rajas. There's another important word in the Buddhist tradition, which is uh, it's kind of like, uh, I translate it as attraction. So, raga, raga is one of the three poisons, one of the three kleshas, and means attraction. It's kind of like stimulation. Raga, raga is often translated as lust. And for tonight, at least because of a lot of the metaphors that are going to go on, you can think of it as a kind of sexual stimulation. But I translate, or I like to think of raga as attraction, being stimulated, kind of uh, being 
kind of excited, but it doesn't have to be like really, you know, frenetic excitement. It's just this idea of sort of being like, ooh, ooh. And so there's a kind of interesting relations be relationship between Raja and Raga. <laughs> so those two are now at play because now what we're thinking about, <laughs> this use of the term dust in early Buddhism, it's about like, what does it mean for our sensory organs to get dusty? It means that we start to become inclined to inclined towards or you know conditioned in the sense of being stimulated stimulated by certain things and then from a buddhist point of view what's that what that is doing is clouding our vision and so the idea is is that you could see something but because of your associations with it, because of your past associations with it and all of that, when you see that thing, it might make you excited. Ooh. And what's important to keep in mind from a Buddhist point of view is that somebody else might not find that Dharma, might not find that object stimulating. So it's a very kind of um, personal thing to get stimulated by something. And so that kind of stimulation, attraction to objects is considered a kind of uh, dusty buildup. And it can be a dusty buildup in terms of the way that we see, a dusty buildup in terms of the way that we hear, a dusty buildup of smelling, definitely in terms of eating, we get kind of excited about certain foods and other foods might turn us off in that way. So there's a kind of dust in terms of our, our taste in that sense. Obviously feeling is inclined towards certain types of feelings in that sense. And then of course, there's the sixth sensory organ, the brain or the kind of the mind in that way, that is also dusty. And so what they talk about in the early Buddhist tradition is removing the dust, getting the dust out of the sensory organs in order to see clearly. Now, that thing of getting the dust out of one's sensory organs in order to see clearly, that is a process that is basically known as Visuddhi, pure purification. So now what we're talking about tonight is ideas of purity and purification within Buddhism as it pertains to this metaphor of the dust. And so what we want to be noticing is sort of, well, actually, I want to go back to the the lovely Diga Nikaya that I read from a moment ago, where it says, the household life is close and dusty. The homeless life is free as air. It's not easy living the household life to live the fully perfected holy life, purified and polished like a conch shell. So there you have this kind of reference to the purification, like a pure conch shell in that sense. So we have this contrast, the dusty household life or the purified conch shell. So that now becomes a kind of operating metaphor, but also a thing within Buddhism, the process of purification. But what does it mean to purify? to get rid of that dust. And what does it mean to get rid of that dust? Well, you know, we're kind of talking about a form of prejudice, prejudgment, but not in the negative sense where things are being prejudged as bad or prejudged as whatever. It's kind of the opposite form of 
prejudice, prejudgment, where it's being prejudged as great, prejudged as wonderful, prejudged as, say, beautiful, sexy, stimulating in that way. So what they talk about, and by the way, now I want to introduce yet another <laughs> aspect of the dust. In, in the early Buddhist tradition, in fact, it starts with the very, very, very first teaching of the Buddha, the very first sutra, the turning of the Dharma wheel. After the Buddha teaches the Four Noble Truths, there's one of the five monks that uh, gets it, get, like understands it, Kondanya. Kondanya gets it. And what they say, what the sutra says about Kondanya, who gets it, they talk about Kundanya having purified his Dharma eye. And that becomes a thing, a, a thing that happens in the early forms of Buddhism, which is that one's Dharma eye becomes purified. And then even in the Mahayana sutras that we've been reading, like the, the Manjushri sutra that we've been reading and that we are going to read a little bit more tonight, even in that sutra, after somebody gives a, one of the bodhisattvas gives a Dharma discourse, all of a sudden, you know, people will generate bodhicitta and some people will get their Dharma eyes purified. And what, if you go digging deeper into the reference of purifying one's Dharma eye, what is one's Dharma eye purified of? The dust of the world. So let's go a little bit deeper into the dust in that way. I kind of want to like bring up another metaphor, if I may. <laughs> so in addition to all of these other metaphors, there's another one regarding the sense organs. And this is a really interesting one. The way that you can think about it is thinking about your sensory organs as like mirrors, mirrors with like hearing, for example, mirrors with the potential to boing, perfectly reflect sounds heard, to perfectly reflect things seen. So perfectly reflective mirrors. And then of course, a mirror-like mind perfectly reflective of everything that's going on around us. So now the senses are now like mirrors and the dust settles on the mirror. And how well can you see in a dusty old mirror, right? It's hard to see in a dusty old mirror. <laughs> and so they talk about getting the dust off of the mirror. And when you can finally get the dust all the way off, your mind, your senses become dynamically, perfectly reflective of reality. And you know what's interesting about a mirror? If you think about the surface of a mirror that is reflecting images, ooh, right? Uh, let's say, and then I, I put a... I put a clock up in front of the mirror and all of a sudden there's a clock in the mirror. And then I put a Vajra up in front of the mirror and all of a sudden there's a Vajra in the mirror. You know what's wild about the surface of a mirror? It never says, whoa, 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 whoa wait up. I'm not done reflecting the clock yet. Whoa, whoa, wait. <laughs> a surface of a mirror just doesn't hold on. It doesn't hold on to anything. It just perfectly reflects and moves on to whatever the new reflection is in that way. And so that, that dynamic, uh, just flawless reflection of a pure surface of a mirror is sort of the metaphor for enlightenment, for a purified mind in that way. Like what, is, what that's like. 
And so a way to think about the dust settling on the mirror-like mind, one of the ways that I think about it is sort of about, it's kind of about holding on to the past in a way. And so that those past experiences and the past, the past dust is still on the mirror. So from before. And so what happens is, is that when I see something, I'm kind of, again, judging it based upon that prior experience with it. That's why I use the word prejudice or prejudgment, because the idea is it's like, oh, I've seen, I've seen one of you before. I know what you're all about because I've seen one of your kind before, right? And that's a big stain. That's a big chunk of dust on the mind that is not being able to see dynamically the person who's right in front of us. We're seeing them through the lens of past experience and being like, well, since you look like that other person and I didn't like that other person, I definitely don't like you. And that's all kind of dusty thinking, dusty sensory perception in that sense. And so again, the process or one of the ways of talking about the Buddhist purification process is purifying, clarifying our Dharma eye the eye that can see phenomena, these dharmas, but not with our dust on top of them or without the dust on top of our sensory organs. So, all right, everybody doing okay? Yeah, Tanya. Um, so, sorry I got here late, so maybe huh? you said it earlier, but the dust sounds to me like conditioning. Yeah, it is, it is. It's kind of, um, I would, I agree with you, and it does sound like that. I'm definitely kind of leaning that way. But I want you to know that there's also, like, and Tanya, I know you are, but maybe not everybody else is, but if you're familiar with the idea of the vedana, the sensory reactions, and the way that we are conditioned, and yes, Tanya, that's the way conditioning fits into this, but you'll know or remember that the way that we react to things mm -hmm. is based upon our conditioning. Mm. But the rajas, it has a little bit more to do with specifically positive reactions. There's just something about the rajas that it is about stimulation. It's just one of those things that we want to just kind of keep in mind that the that particular rajas. Now, it gets more interesting. Everybody okay, though? Any more questions, comments, answers, ideas? Yeah. Okay. So now, oh, yeah, Jenny. Yay. Okay, so I even wrote this down because you started talking about dust. Yep. Then you related it to pollen. Yep. Which is related to sex. Yep. And then is dust just a metaphor for desire? Yeah. 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 In that way. Yep. Yep. That's the idea. So on that note, before I actually get to the next section, I want to kind of then, you know, be kind of a little more clear about what it would mean then to be dust free in that sense. And, you know, so the idea is, is that, yeah, I think, I think we all know this about the tradition, but I, I think I need to remind us, we're sort of always interested in moving towards equanimity. It's sort of always kind of the name of the Buddhist game in that sense. Always moving towards upeksha, this sort of in a more even level, tranquil state of being. And so the idea is, is that that kind of stimulation, that kind of desire, that kind of like, ooh, is a disturbance to the mind in that way. But more importantly than 
and this is where Tanya and Jenny, both of your comments or ideas in that way are really important. It's like, it's about the metaphor of the accrual of the dust. That's what they kind of want to talk about is the way that it's like one little dust particle settles and then another little dust particle settles and then another one and another one. And so it's a slow buildup of this dusty mirror in that sense. Now, I mentioned that all in that way because now we're going to shift out of the early Buddhist tradition that was, as we know, as I often mention, the early Buddhist tradition was a little more obsessed with sex, a little more obsessed with celibacy, a little more obsessed with that particular form of desire. Now we're going to kind of get more into the Mahayana tradition that has a more broad interest in desire and understands that desire for whatever could be and sometimes is just as strong as the sexual desire. And so let's talk about desire and not focus on a specific flavor of desire. So when we move into the Mahayana tradition, and I kind of, again, this is sort of tracing a little genealogy of this dust metaphor. I wanna share with you now this beautiful section from what is known as the Platform Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch, or sometimes just known as the Sutra of Hui Neng, or Hui Neng. Uh, so Hui Neng was a Chinese Buddhist monk. You might have heard of him. He's kind of one of the granddaddies of the Zen Buddhist tradition. If you've never read the Platform Sutra, as it's called, or it's also sometimes, again, the Sutra of Hui Neng. What's fascinating about this Sutra is that it's called a Sutra. And it even begins, if you've never read it, I'm, I'm going to give you a quick summary. It's a Chinese text about a Chinese Zen master named Hui Neng. But they call it a Sutra. And it even begins with the author of it saying, like, to the best of my recollection, or something to that effect. So it's kind of a play on the thus have I heard. And it says that to the best of my recollection, the, the master, Hui Neng, was staying such and such a place. And there were great ministers and Confucian officials. And so it's a very funny play on the classic form of a sutra in which the star of it is not the Buddha, not even a bodhisattva, but Hui Neng, a, an illiterate Chinese uh, poor person, basically. Like not you, the person you, that you would expect to be the great enlightened master, right? And the story of this sutra is about this young, impoverished, illiterate, country bumpkin kind of person, Hui Neng, who overhears just four lines of the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra. And just hearing those four lines becomes enlightened. And so he goes to a monastery, a famous monastery, and wants to gain entry in order to finish his training and to become a Buddha, as he says. And this is a very sort of like formal, very old school Chinese Buddhist monastery. And here this like bright eyed young kid from the South, from the country shows up out of nowhere. And so they make him actually work in the kitchen. They won't even let him come in and be a monk because he's low caste or low class, I should say. And what happens is, is that the head of this monastery is getting ready to pass away. And so he wants to hand over the patriarchship. He wants to hand the keys to the monastery to one of the students. 
And so he says, you know what? I'm, I'm getting ready to enter final nirvana. So I want you all to write a poem, um, a gatha, a mind verse that captures your level of enlightenment. And whoever's the most enlightened gets the keys to the monastery. And the, the funny part about the story is, is that none of the students write a poem because they are all too afraid of offending the headmaster, the head of the head of the school. Meanwhile, the head of the school isn't very convinced that he should be the leader of the monastery. And so in the middle of the night, he secretly writes out a little poem and he thinks, ah, if the master likes my poem, I'll say, I did it. But if he doesn't like it, then I can pretend like I don't even know who wrote it. That's his big plan. And this teacher, the senior teacher, the headmaster, he writes the po a poem and it says, our body is the Bodhi tree and our minds a mirror bright. Carefully, we must wipe it hour by hour, letting no dust settle. So there we have it. The entire practice of purification encapsulated in a beautiful mind verse, right? So the next day, the, the, the headmaster, the patriarch, he sees the poem and he reads it and he says, this is a very good poem, but this is not enlightened. And he says, basically, until I, you know, I find somebody who writes an enlightened poem, nobody gets, to, nobody gets the keys to the monastery. Meanwhile, Hui Nang, the hero, he's in the kitchen. He doesn't know anything about all of this. And so one of the student monks goes walking by the kitchen and recites the poem and says, our body is the Bodhi tree, our minds a mirror bright. Hour by hour, we must carefully clean it to let no dust settle. And Hui Nung starts laughing. And he says, what's that? And the student tells him all about the contest and all about the poems and all of that. And Hui Nung says, well, I could write a poem better than that. Show me where this uh, poem contest is going on. <laughs> and so the student goes, and because Hui Nung is illiterate, he asked the student, will you write my poem for me? And I'll tell you what to say. And the guy, and the guy says, sure. And Hui Nung's poem is, there is no Bodhi tree, nor a stand for the mirror. Since all is empty, where could the dust settle? Needless to say, Hui Nung gets the keys to the monastery. <laughs> he wins the contest because his poem demonstrates the Mahayana teaching of emptiness. The emptiness of the body, the emptiness of the mind, the emptiness of the dust itself. And that is sort of the next phase of the metaphor of the dust. That there is no mirror <laughs> where, and there's no dust. What, what is there to settle on what? <laughs> so that's where the Mahayana tradition moves into this different area where they're talking about non-duality, they're talking about emptiness, they're talking about all of those ideas. But what I want you to know is that that metaphor of the dust, you know, it's still right there in the discourse in that sense. There's a few other things that I could tell you about, but I do want to get to the sutra. The only thing that I want to mention, and this is sort of a, a bracketed side note, I've mentioned a few times, and it even came up in the sutra, that in the, the famous Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra that I already mentioned once, in that sutra, the Vajra Sutra, 
the Buddha gets around to talking about all of the dust particles in a world system. And in fact, he even goes so far as to talk about grinding, grinding an entire universe into dust and asks the monk Subhuti, and could you count all of that dust? And I just want you to know that whenever the Buddhists are talking about dust, they are always talking about it in these many, many, you know, multivaried ways in that sense. And so my point about the Vajra Sutra is there is this interesting way that, let me see, how could I put this? In the original form of Buddhism that I was talking about, certain, certain things were considered dust. Things like kind of sexual desire, sexual craving, things like that. A certain kinds of like uh, maybe mania or certain sorts of obsessions would be sort of the dust. But my point is, is that in the early Buddhist path, the dust was like there was the dust and then there was like the Dharma and there was a purified conch shell and there was a Bodhisattva and there was like all kinds of other things and the dust was over here. When the Buddha's getting around to grinding the entire universe into dust, it's another kind of way of getting to equanimity where there's a way of seeing it all as dust, all of its dust. <laughs> there's nothing that's not dusty in that way. And then that becomes a kind of transcendence of it all, not just a transcendence of this little aspect of the world or this little aspect of the world, or, oh, I'll leave the dusty household life for the pure life of the monastery. That sounds like more dust. <laughs> that idea that the monastery is a purified realm and the, that the house is a defiled dusty realm, that sounds dusty. <laughs> That's the Mahayana Bodhisattva way of thinking about the dust in that way, <laughs> is let's really get to what the dust is. So, that's sort of been a long introduction to the idea of dust. Any questions, comments, answers, or ideas before we move even further? <laughs> excellent, excellent. Okay. So where we're going next is back to the sutra we've been reading. So we're going back to the Manjushri's Pure Land Sutra. Thank you, uh, Noam. So Noam put the link to the sutra. And I will, like I said, we are in a section of the sutra that is not, unfortunately, it's not in the treasury of Mahayana sutras. I have been reading from the Tibetan version from the 84,000 dot read. But tonight, I think I will be reading from my translation, which is from the Chinese, which awesome. Tanya even put a link to that in the chat. So I'm not going to review everything, obviously, that we've covered up to this point. But I do want you to know that we are continuing from last week. We are continuing to look at a section of the sutra that is the Dharma door on the single characteristic. And I was, I mentioned this last week, I was very excited to find this section of this sutra because it has this really beautiful complement to that section in the Vimalakirti Sutra, which is the Dharma door on non-duality. Chapter nine of the Vimalakirti Sutra is this really beautiful uh, poem where it's a series of bodhisattvas that each give like one or two lines 
about the idea of non-duality. And then the next bodhisattva sort of riffs, they kind of riff off of the previous bodhisattva a little bit. So you get a kind of um, like a daisy chain of Dharma that goes on. And it's one of those things where any one of the bodhisattvas, the thing that they say about non-duality is a Dharma door, is a teaching. And you could just take that one thing and go meditate on it. But there is also a teaching that happens if you read it all the way through, because there's this like build up, build up, build up, build up, and then this kind of payoff at the end of the whole thing. Well, I was excited to find, I had never seen this before. I didn't know that there were other Dharma doors like this. So in the Manjushri Sutra, we come to this section where Manjushri, same bodhisattvas in Vimalakirti, by the way, Manjushri asks a bunch of bodhisattvas, how do you explain the Dharma door of the single characteristic, the Eka Lakshana? And that was the theme last week, the single characteristic. Again, I'm not going to repeat that whole Dharma talk. What is the single characteristic shared by all dharmas, by all phenomena? Not having any characteristics. <laughs> all phenomena are actually void of characteristics. And that is their, the one characteristic shared by everything. Once again, we're express route to equanimity. This is the idea of the single, te the single characteristic teaching. It's about putting all dharmas on an even level playing field where any one idea is no better or worse than any other idea or concept. All dharmas are equanimous. That is kind of the heart of this teaching of the single characteristic. So last week, I started reading this section. And I don't know, I got how many bodhisattvas in? One, two, let's see, one, two, three, four. We only got five bodhisattvas in. I'm not going to go over the ones that we already did because I want to get to the new ones. But there's something I kind of want to mention that I didn't mention last week. We had a lot to cover last week. So these bodhisattvas, right? For example, where we left off, it's a bodhisattva whose name translated into English is like excellent contemplation bodhisattva. Like, yeah, you want, I would, you, you'd want to find a word. And I'll, show, I'll tell you why. It's very, very obvious in the Chinese. It's very obvious in the Sanskrit, or at least the Tibetan, which comes from the Sanskrit. So it would be really nice to capture this in English, and I'll tell you what it is. So how does the Bodhisattva excellent comprehension explain the Dharma door of the single characteristic? Well, excellent contemplation Bodhisattva says that if one enters the inconceivable, by way of the conceivable, this inconceivableness also being unattainable, this is called explaining the single characteristic Dharma door. So we're kind of working right there with, with a, a kind of a non-duality between the ideas of conceivable and inconceivable. We, of course, I did a whole talk one night on the idea of the inconceivable. So this idea of sort of the inconceivable, like you can't even think of it. It's like beyond thought. It's kind of like along the lines of ineffable, unsayable, unthinkable, just beyond the realm of thought. Doesn't 
doesn't that very idea assume this idea of thought? Doesn't that very idea of inconceivable never escape the idea of conceivability? That's sort of along the lines of entering the inconceivable through the conceivable. That's sort of one of the ways you could think of that. Again, when, when the Bodhisattva also says, and also, by the way, the inconceivable being unattainable, that's the single characteristic Dharma door. Pretty straightforward as far as these things go, especially as far as these other bodhisattvas go, this is gonna be one of the easier ones. But what I want you to know, what I really want you to know this evening is that the bodhisattva's name has in it the idea of like conceiving, con concept conceptualizing. So ex excellent conceptualizing bodhisattva said if one enters the inconceptual by way of the conceptual <laughs> so i'm just point i just want to point out how the bodhisattva's name is absolutely wrapped up in what they are talking about and this kind of goes along with what i'm always saying about these bodhisattvas that it's probably better to think of them more just that they are about their name and that they are not like a historical figure or a being or a god or an angel or anything like that, but that they are an idea. Excellent contemplation. And the bodhisattva, excellent contemplation, teaches the single characteristic Dharma door this way that happens to deal with thinking or conceptualizing in that sense. Everybody follow me on that? Questions, comments, just about that one? Oh, yep, yep. Um, I, I feel like uh, the idea that the inconceivable is, I think I understand what he's saying about the idea that the, the inconceivable attained through the conceivable is, and, and uh, is the, the door of the one characteristic. But my question is, is there a way to realize the inconceivable that is not through the conceivable? Or is that kind of, is that the world of Mahayana is, is, is the world in which we think of this? Like, yeah, we use the conceivable to think of the inconceivable and that is why it's neither conceivable or inconceivable or whatever the, you know, but are, are isn't isn't it also possible in Buddhism to just somehow attain the inconceivable without going through the conceivable? Yes, yes, of course. Okay, yeah. thank you. These these poems should really be read like in isolation, that they are just their own little statements about like um you know, one of these bodhisattvas might say, you know, to, to walk the path where there is no path, that is the single characteristic Dharma door. And they're just kind of making a poetic statement that is rather a little maybe paradoxical or something like that, but it's not making a real definitive statement about the inconceivable or bigger ideas, if that makes sense, Noam. Okay, now I don't mean to, to speed past uh, Bodhisattva excellent contemplation, but I, I really wanted to get to the next Bodhisattva. That's why I told you all about the dust. So in the Chinese, just let's start with the Chinese one that I'm translating here. The next Bodhisattva, if you translate it literally, this Bodhisattva is Wonderfully dust free. That's the name of this bodhisattva. Wonderfully dust free. 
Now, when we go to the Tibetan, we see that the name of this Bodhisattva is, and I'll, I'll write it down just so you can see it, but the name of this Bodhisattva is Viraja. Viraja. And the V here is not our normal V that we're used to, which would mean divided or split. It's a different prefix V that means like beyond, outside of, gone, like um, free of in that sense. So this Bodhisattva's name, Viraja, is dust free dustless I, dustless might be kind of a, a good way of, of saying it but in the chinese they add just a kind of honorific that it's wonderfully dust free bodhisattva so let's see what viraja wonderfully dust free has to tell us so viraja bodhisattva says that if all untainted characteristics are also neither tainted nor untainted without raga attraction or devesha aversion and also without moha confusion neither singular nor dual and also not verital without any grasping, without any releasing. This is called explaining the single characteristic Dharma door. All right, let's, I will, let's take a peek at the Tibetan, see how that sounds. Oh, that's why I didn't want to read the Tibetan one. So unfortunately, the Tibetan they went one direction with the translation, which kind of misses the, the play of words that's going on. So for some reason, they translate what the Chinese was calling being tainted. And the word taint or stain is so important to the idea of raja. So it's unfortunate that they just went for the the taint or the stain is attachment so they translate it as attachment which is kind of fine because that is a, the kind of stain or the kind of taint that we are interested in but you do you lose the metaphor when you translate it literally or not even literally when you translate it interpretively in that sense I digress. The Bodhisattva Viraja added or said, the Dharma teaching, the Dharma door, on the single principle characteristic expresses that which is totally free from attachment. In it, there is neither attachment to characteristics nor absence of attachment. There's no attachment, no anger, no delusion. There's no oneness or duality. No doing, no not doing. No accepting, no rejecting. Okay, so that's the Tibetan. Now let's break it down. So... The first thing that we're dealing with is that the metaphor is this one of being tainted. And it's helpful to also know that the word klesha, the, what is normally translated as affliction or defilement, mental affliction, the word klesha means stain. So now we have this raja, which is a dust, but, oh, and I don't even think I mentioned this at the very beginning of the talk. Another meaning of the word, the old, old, old meaning of the word raja, dust, is also die. And you, and you can get to die 
pretty easily because if you think of one of the main forms of dye in India is turmeric powder, turmeric dust. So turmeric raja, rajas. So the stain, or sorry, the, the powder is the dye. So you have these multiple metaphors going on. Stain, dye, all of these different things. The Bodhisattva Viraja, their poem is playing off of these multiple meanings of stain and dye. But what does the Bodhisattva have to say about that? First, in the Chinese, if all untainted characteristics are also neither tainted nor untainted. So what's an untainted characteristic? An untainted, unstained characteristic is a reference to a kind of early Buddhist idea. So we're referring back to my opening remarks about the term dust and all of that in early Buddhism. And so the idea is, is that let's say, what could it be? You know, what, I mean, I've got so many props over here. I could use any number of them. It doesn't really matter. Because all I'm going to say is, what if you were the type of person who, when you saw a record or whatever it is, that the, the characteristics of being circular, flat, with a hole in the middle, that these characteristics were like exciting. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you're a DJ Maybe you're a, a, a record collector, vinyl record collector, just an audiophile, or, or maybe you're a, um, a junkyard, kind of a uh, flea market salesman, whatever it is. The idea is you might see these characteristics and you'd get excited by it. And you'd be like, whoa, what record is that? Wow, whoa, da da da. Meanwhile, again, somebody else sees a circle and another circle and it's flat and it's black and their mind is not excited by that it's a circle dude so the idea is is that one mind is all excited about the characteristics the characteristics are making them excited in the early Buddhist tradition, if, if you could purify the mind like we were describing, like polishing the mirror kind of idea, and you got to the point where you could see the round, flat, black object, but it wasn't producing the, 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 woo, the excitement, those characteristics would be untainted. Because you're not excited anymore about flat circle things. <laughs> they are just flat circles. <laughs> and so just flat circles is an untainted, those are now the characteristics, but untainted. Okay, but the Bodhisattva Viraja, free of all the dust, wants us to know that if all untainted characteristics are also neither tainted nor untainted. And he has more to say, but that's kind of getting to the single characteristic Dharma door. So it's kind of along the lines of what I was saying earlier about, oh, the pure monastery and the defiled dusty house, well, that is still a dusty view. The idea that that is a pure, the monastery is a pure realm or whatever, that's a, a prejudice as well in that sense. So this is along those lines of, of like really transcending all the dust 
in that way. So our bodhisattva wants us to know that even if you come to that idea of the untainted characteristics, and then if that idea of untainted characteristics is without the idea of taint or not taint, we're moving completely outside the paradigm of pure and impure, totally outside the paradigm of good and bad, right? That's, we're getting there. He has more to say, but that's the first part. So if, if regarding all untainted characteristics, they are neither tainted nor untainted, in the same breath, we are saying also, without any attraction, aversion, or confusion. Those are the three poisons, right? Those are the three, raga, devesha, and moha. And again, that's where it's about this idea of raga and its relationship to raja, the dust, right? The stimulation, the raga from the dust, the raja. Our bodhisattva tells us that in this kind of, I don't even know what to call it, I guess non-dual, <laughs> but in this non-dual state where no, there's no taint or no not taint, there's no attraction, no aversion, no confusion, no singularity, no oneness, nor duality. You got anything else? You got anything else outside of the one idea of oneness or the idea of duality? Well, just in case you do, he adds in here and also not varied. So if you're moving beyond all of that, and then next up, this is the really important one. Without grasping and without releasing. That's called the single characteristic Dharma door. Yeah, Tanya. Uh, can you say more about the not varied? Ah, yeah, it's a tricky one. And it's interesting because it's not in the Tibetan. Um, actually, it is in the Tibetan, but they trans, or it's, it reads differently. The, the Tibetan says no oneness or duality. So we're totally lined up with that. But the Tibetan, at least the English translation from the Tibetan says no doing or not doing. The Chinese doesn't seem to say anything about doing or not doing. It seems to say no oneness, no duality, and no multifold. No, like, no threes no fours no five like, six, no mul like no multiverse kind of thing okay yeah oh but that would be a good way to think of it if you were getting okay. cosmological and thinking about oneness mm -hmm. duality or yeah multiverse awesome okay. yeah thanks beyond all of that yeah now the last part that i mentioned that's kind of the most important in terms of mahayana buddhism so the very last aspect of the Bodhisattva's Dharma door, the very last aspect is that this, he, what he's describing, this the single characteristic, it's with, without grasping or relinquishment or releasing. And that is so important because the entire, early Buddhist path is entirely predicated on the idea that suffering is caused from attachment and liberation, enlightenment, and everything else comes from relinquishment. We are attached to stuff, self, and ideas, call them views, drishtis, so we are attached to stuff, self, and views, and liberation comes from relinquishment of attachment to self, possessions, and views. So the, in the early path, the entire thing is about moving away from clinging to relinquishment. 
What is so interesting about the Bodhisattva path and Mahayana Buddhism is that when one understands emptiness, one understands that there is nothing to be clinging to. And therefore, there's nothing to let go of. And at that point, it is a tradition that is beyond attachment and relinquishment. So very interesting kind of state or very interesting kind of thing to consider, which is, huh, huh, what does that look like? <laughs> a state that is not attached, not clinging to stuff, but is also not relinquished of things either. So that's how the Bodhisattva Virajya would tran or would describe or explain the Ekya Lakshana. That it's if all untainted characteristics are also not tainted or untainted, there's no attraction, no aversion, no confusion, no oneness, no duality, no multiplicity, nothing grasped, no relinquishment. That's the single characteristic Dharma door. How's everybody feeling about all that? Any questions, comments, answers, ideas? Cool. Then it'll be fun to do another Bodhisattva. Because I, I love sharing all of these little details with you. So the next Bodhisattva, and in the Tibetan, yep, it's Sagara, Sagara, the Bodhisattva Sagara, Sagara, also the same in, uh, in the Chinese. And in fact, in the Chinese, it's transliterated, Sagara. So it's no, no uh, question there. But who is Sagara? Who is this Bodhisattva? Well, this is where if you, you know, you, if you don't know all of your, your, um, your trivia, and that's all of your Buddhist trivia, you, you might not know that this Sagara is a Naga king, a particular Naga king. And as a Naga king, where do the Nagas hang out? Well, they are oceanic kings. So Nagas, of course, reside in the waters, and Sagara, Sagara is considered an oceanic Naga king. Well, what does the Bodhisattva Sagara have to tell us? Well, if one is able to enter the extremely profound Dharma, which is difficult to enter, like the depths of the ocean, and one doesn't differentiate this dharma and explains it to others, yet without speech or concepts. This is called explaining the single characteristic dharma door. Okay, so the, the main metaphor is if one is enter, able to enter the depths of the dharma like a great ocean, well, that perfectly complements the fact that this is a Naga, oceanic Naga king, right? So there's the poetic, kind of the poetic play or the word play that's going on with this Bodhisattva. The way in which there's a, there's a kind of a daisy chain thing going on with these Bodhisattvas as well. In the last Bodhisattva, uh, Viraja that we just spent the bulk of our time on, there's a way in which from that bodhisattva, we've gotten to this, this most subtle realm of the Dharma, right? When we're talking about when, when all untainted characteristics are seen as neither tainted nor untainted, you know, I said it earlier, I, I don't even know if that's non-duality anymore. We're in some other kind of realm almost. 
Well, that is entering the subtle depths of the Dharma, the profound Dharma that like reaches the, the edge of conceivability in that way. So there's a way in which the last Bodhisattva, Viraja, has put us in, you know, this, the mind state that is in the depths of the Dharma. So then our Naga King Bodhisattva says, yeah, and if one is able to enter the extremely profound Dharma, which is difficult to enter, like the depths of the ocean, but doesn't differentiate this Dharma, meaning doesn't differentiate it as special, profound, super deep, at the edges of conceivability, and so on and so forth. So once again, the bodhisattvas have done it to us, where they've like, whoa, wait a minute. So the super, the profound dharma, but don't, we don't differentiate that dharma as profound. But it gets better. If one is able to enter the profound dharma, just like the ocean, so deep, doesn't differentiate that dharma as being profound or deep, and is able to explain that to others, but without using language, speech, or concepts. That's the single characteristic dharma door. Whoa, okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, folks, I'm not that good. I cannot do it. I can't explain the single characteristic without saying something, right? Without relying on some concept in that way. But that would be it. If one were able to do that, that would be the single characteristic Dharma door, or that's explaining the single characteristic. Everybody feeling okay about the Naga King? Yeah, Tanya. Oh. You could do an interpretive dance. Mm. No, 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 I'm just, of course, joking, but. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed, but I wonder, you know, if that would qualify as a form of speech or because part of what they're talking about with speech, by the way, Tanya, is sort of like um, like any form of yeah, 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 yeah. No, I was just joking. I was just I, like, I, 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 it's like it's like how else? Yeah, noble yeah, silence. You just yeah. <laughs> I really like that verse. Yeah, this is a beautiful, beautiful section. In fact, let's do one more beautiful one since we have time. So this one, all right. So this Bodhisattva's name is, and it's, this is interesting because in the Tibetan, they translate this name literally. And so I will tell you that in both the, in both the, uh, both Chinese Tibetan, the name of this Bodhisattva is a top on top of the moon, on top of the moon Bodhisattva, Ch Chandrat Tara, Atara, Uttara Tara is above in that way, Chanda Chandra is moon, so ta Chandra Tara. Bodhisattva is the, the Bodhisattva that sits atop the moon. Beautiful name. Chandratara Bodhisattva says, if one practices equanimity toward the minds of all sentient beings, and like a full moon without perceiving sentient beings, this is called explaining the single characteristic Dharma door. From the Tibetan, uh, they translate the name of this bodhisattva to superior moon, superior meaning above, but they're doing it literally. So the bodhisattva superior moon added, the Dharma teaching, the Dharma door on the single characteristic expresses the moon-like quality 
of having an equanimous attitude toward all beings without conceptualizing sentient beings. All right, so that very good translation. I like the way that that reads. I'm still working on mine as always. So this is a kind of a, you, you, you might have heard this before. This is sort of one of those things that comes up in Buddhism. They often describe the Buddha as having a face like a full moon. And this Bodhisattva is sort of referencing that because what they say about the full moon is that they say that it, it shines for everybody and doesn't discriminate in that shining. The moon doesn't say, no, 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 those people don't get to see me. Only those people get to see me. No, there's a certain equanimity of the moon, they say, that it just is there. Oh, and it, it also has to do with, because of course this is true of the sun as well, but what they say about a full moon is that everybody likes to look at one. And I have found that to be true, <laughs> that it's hard to find somebody that doesn't appreciate a nice, beautiful full moon. So you have this idea of a pleasing to look at kind of a vibe, but then this idea of the moonlight shining equally on everybody without discrimination, without prejudice, of course, just totally equanimously, right? So that's what the quality of the single characteristic is like. It's like a full moon shining on all beings equally. But then we get that last little bodhisattva twist. And the moon also shines on all sentient beings, but the moon doesn't think that it's shining on all sentient beings. So it does so without the concept of sentient beings. And that speaks to the Bodhisattva path. Because as we've talked about many, many times now, one of the defining characteristics of a Bodhisattva is this really interesting, somewhat paradoxical position of having infinite amounts of compassion for all sentient beings without having the notion that there are such things as sentient beings. Now, not having the notion there are, that there are such things as sentient beings is a reference to the idea of emptiness and all phenomena having an empty nature or having no inherent nature, no svabhava. And so that idea of the wisdom that understands no svabhava, the wisdom that understands emptiness knows that there's no such thing as a sentient being. Yet that intellect, that wisdom doesn't not be compassionate towards all sentient beings. And by the way, this sutra has mentioned many, many times that interesting character, the solitary enlightened Buddha, the Pratekya Buddha. And the Mahayana sutras are always saying, like, well, you don't, you don't want to be a Pratekya Buddha. You want to be a Bodhisattva. Well, what would it mean to be a Pratekya Buddha? Basically, the idea is, is that a Pratekya Buddha, a solitary enlightened one, knows all phenomena have no svabhava, understands emptiness. And therefore, why give, there is no compassion for whom? Who is giving, it's absurd. So the Pratekya Buddha, because of an understanding of emptiness and the lack of self-nature, isn't compassionate, doesn't have loving kindness, out of wisdom in that sense. And that's where the Buddhas basically say, you don't want to be a Pratekya Buddha. Sure, they're wise, but what they say is, is that they, they cut off the lineage of the Buddhas. They let that wisdom die with them and they cut off the lineage of the Buddhas. 
Next week, I'll have more to say about the lineage of the Buddhas and more about compassion for all sentient beings, but I think I'm going to end it here unless there's any last minute questions, comments, answers, or ideas. Cool, yeah, we have a few more bodhisattvas to go in this beautiful section, so we'll do that next week. Otherwise, that's it for me.